Hi, good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and, and get started. Appreciate all of you uh, for coming and for joining us online. My name is Chris Weed. I'm Executive Director of the Stiegler Center for the Study of the Economy and the State here at Chicago Booth. We're happy to continue our mini course with uh, Tarek Hassan from Boston University uh, on, economic, uh, on economic analysis using text. Uh, today's second and final seminar topic is on the diffusion of disruptive technologies after our discussion uh, from two days ago on country risk. Uh, a couple notes before we uh, start this event. We are on the record. We're live streaming. Uh, we do ask those of you who are in the room uh, to silence your phones. You're welcome to continue to use social media and whatnot. Uh, and as usual, the views expressed uh, by our guests are uh, their views, not the views of the Stiegler Center or the university. Uh, as many of you may know, the center supports and diffuses research on regulatory capture and various distortions that special interest groups impose on capitalism and free markets. We have a variety of initiatives, including our podcast, Capitalism, hosted by our faculty director, Luigi Zingales, and Bethany McLean, our online publication, promarket.org. Uh, we also have a variety of webinars and online events uh, happening in April. On April 5th, we have uh, a webinar on anti-corruption efforts in Ukraine and the role of the media. Uh, one of our guests will be an alum of uh, our Journalists in Residence program. Uh, you can also sign up to watch our flagship antitrust and competition conference that's happening later in April. All of that information is available on the Stiegler Center uh, website. Um, so back to this afternoon, uh, we do look forward to hearing uh, Tarek's insights. We will take questions. For those of you in the room, we ask that you hold uh, your questions until we can get a microphone uh, to you so that our guests online can hear you uh, as, as well. So uh, Tarek is a professor of economics at Boston University. His research focuses on international and uh, macro finance, as well as social factors uh, in economic growth. Previously, uh, he taught at Harvard. Uh, and uh, previously also here at the university. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Tarek to the stage. Okay, so thank, thank you very much. Um, so on Tuesday, uh, we talked about how we can use the texts uh, generated by the firm's management and their investors during their quarterly earnings calls to learn something about the risks and opportunities that these firms are exposed to. Um, so today I want to continue on the theme that essentially firms produce a lot of text that can help us understand what's going on in the economy, but we're going to take a completely different angle. So this paper is uh, going to be about trying to answer some very long-standing questions in economics by intersecting the corpuses of text that are out there. So patents, we're going to look at patents, intersect them with job postings, Wikipedia, and earnings calls. So we're going to have four corpuses of text, and we're going to look at the overlap in the, uh, in the language of these texts to learn something about the diffusion of new technologies. So it's, uh, it's kind of uncontroversial that uh, technological progress is really key to economic growth. Uh, but recently there's sort of been also some discussion about the downsides of that process. So people are worried about income inequality and, for example, uh, whether uh, jobs that relate to new technologies uh, are basically only for the high skilled. So require college degrees and advanced degrees and maybe leave uh, other people behind. And similarly, people are worried about regional inequalities and whether jobs relating to new technologies spread away from the places where they were invented. So the key issues in trying to, like, in trying to address these questions is that it's kind of hard to um, measure the development of multiple technological advances in a single framework. So basically, one big output from this paper is going to be I'm going to tell you which are the technologies that have most affected firms and businesses over the last couple of decades. So, so we don't know the answer to that. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to use the full text of patents, Wikipedia, job postings, and earnings calls to identify influential technological innovations 
trace them to the locations and firms where they were developed, and then also measure the, the, their diffusion across space, so through regions, firms, and skill levels. So here are the main findings of the paper up front. The first main finding kind of surprised me, which is that technologies that preoccupy the discussions of managers with their investors are the same technologies that are also key for jobs. So if you, so, so, uh, if you want to call uh, technologies that preoccupy management time, let's call this, them disruptive, people, some people call them disruptive technologies, those disruptive technologies are also key for the labor market impact of these, of these technological advances. The second main finding is that the development of these very few disruptive technologies is geographically very, very highly concentrated. There's a, f a handful of places in the US that basically produce the innovations that then later affect a ton of jobs around the country. Beyond that, we find that in general, uh, new technologies kind of spread across space, but relatively slowly. So think about like decades, uh, much longer than a politician's election cycle. Uh, and then there's another process that is kind of important for this debate about whether robots are going to replace us. So a key thing about uh, that debate is to know whether technological advances or jobs that relate to new, a specific new technology uh, re will require high skill, in, high skill workers forever or whether over time the technology changes and can be adopted by people with lower skills. And in fact, we do find evidence of the skill broadening that as the technology matures, lower and lower skilled people can, uh, can use it. Um, when you look at the spread of technologies across space, what we find is that the spread is driven actually by low skill, by, by precisely those low skill applications. So it, it tends to be that the places that invented a new technology are leading in jobs in that new technology for a long time, and in particular, the high skill jobs that relate to the research, development, and production of the new technology stick around for a very long time. Uh, and, and the half-life of that is between 30 and 60 years. Okay, so if you're, uh, uh, you know, so often like French mayors ask us about what you need to do to become the next Silicon Valley, the answer is I'm not quite sure what you need to do, but the fact is if you manage to do it, then you're going to have high skill employment in your location for a very long time. Okay, let me skip this and, and go straight into what we do. So the first step of this analysis is to characterize uh, and identify new technologies. And... Um, What's important to keep in mind is that the existing work that we, that we've, so, so existing work in economics has been very successful at taking individual technological advances like, you know, broadband and, you know, robots and specific advances and tracing its spread across space. What we're adding here is basically we're trying to get, add a representative picture of what actually, what other advances are there uh, that are important for, uh, for, for business and jobs. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to intersect the full text of patents that have been filed in the U.S. over the last 40 years with uh, transcripts of earnings conference calls and the text of online job postings. So let me show you this. So this is what a patent looks like. If you've seen a research paper, it kind of looks similar to these patents. Um, it's going to have a title, an abstract, and it's going to describe what, what the technological advance is uh, uh, that the patent is, is being taken out for. Earnings calls we talked about on Tuesday. So we have about 300,000 of them, uh, and the way they work is the management gives a 20-minute or so presentation, and then the firm's analysts can ask questions, and the management is supposed to respond, and we have the transcriptions of these conversations. The reason we have them in here is to basically get a sense of what are the technological advances that uh, managers worry about. <clears throat> and then finally, we have the full text of online job postings. This is a new data source that came online recently, and a lot of economists have been using since. So we have data on 200 million online job postings. It starts in 2010, so we only have 10 years of data on that. Uh, people think that that covers about 80% of all open jobs in the U.S., right? So I'm talking about something that's close to the population of jobs. Um, they tell us for each job posting uh, of some important things about it, like, so where is the job uh, and what kind of occupation is the job in? 
Um, but what we're mainly going to study is the full text of the job announcement. So, you, so if you've ever done this, like um, if, you, if you're writing a job posting to tell you keep it short, tell the people what the job is and what they need to be doing and what their qualifications have to be. Okay, and that's actually ideal for our purposes. All right, so let me tell you how we come up with a list of new technologies. Uh, the first step here is to come up with a list of um, new technological advances. I'm going to do that on two slides. It's, there's a basically a lot of, I'm describing a big Python uh, computer program here, but it's really kind of very simple what we do. So the first step is to identify phrases that are associated with influential innovations. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to take all highly cited patents in the US, so that means patents that have at least 1,000 citations, and I'm going to take the full text of that patent, including the title, the abstract, the whole thing. And I'm going to look at all the two-word combinations that appear in these highly cited patents. And then I'm going to strip out all of those that existed before 1970. So there's this beautiful resource in computational linguistics that's called the Corpus of Historical American English. And what it allows you to do is to basically see what kind of words and phrases were people using at a given point in time. So it's basically literature, newspaper articles, political speeches, people buying coffee, all kinds of things like that. So we're going to take out all language that exists, all two-word combinations. Two-word combinations, by the way, are called bigrams. So we're going to take out all two-word combinations that people were using before 1970, because presu presumably those are not going to be describing uh, innovations that have to, happened after 1970. So, what I, so after that process, I'm going to end up with 35,000 novel bigrams, so two-word combinations that didn't exist before, that are associated with influential patents, because that's where I got them from, from these influential patents. So I'm not going to show you 35,000, but I'm going to show you nine of them. So what you get kind of like fits in roughly three piles. The first pile is fingerprint sensor, monoclonal antibody, OLED display. This is the kind of stuff I want. These are the technological innovations. The second pile are kind of new-ish problems or newly prominent problems like greenhouse gases, Parkinson's disease, and carbon footprint because the patents typically also say what is the problem that they're trying to solve. And the third are things that you could like you know, call managerial innovations like agile product, performance metrics, business model. Things that, you know, maybe like logically existed before 1970, but maybe we, now we have new words describing it. So my objective is I want to find all of those that, that fit into the first column here. So I want to find all of the technological innovations, but not these other things. So I'm going to take my 35,000 biograms, and now in step two, I'm going to leverage Wikipedia. So when you look at Wikipedia, and you stare at it for quite a long time, you're going to realize that naturally, pages describing different things tend to have different formats. So in particular, this one here is about mobile devices, and it says uses and types and characteristics. This next one is about machine learning, and it's going to say something about applications. So what we're going to do is we're going to leverage the fact that the people who write these Wikipedia pages are going to naturally have sort of a structure to this page that either describes a technology or something else. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our 35,000 biograms and we're going to search for each of them in Wikipedia. And now I'm going to assign a Wikipedia page, a primary Wikipedia page, to each of my 35 biograms by looking, can I find the biogram in the title? like machine learning is right in the title, in the summary, or at least 10 times on the page, in that order. So if I find you in the title, that's then I'm done. That's your association. If I don't find you in the title, I'm going to look at the summary, and so on. So I'm going to have one unique Wikipedia page associated with each of my biograms. And then I'm going to keep that biogram if I find at least one section that typically is used to describe a technology, like applications, uses, types, operation, characteristics, features, devices, technical and commercial, but none of the sections that you would expect if we're describing a problem, or none of the sections that you would expect if, you, uh, if we were describing a management technology. So I'm going to say you, you need to have at least one of these, but none of, the, none of this list. 
responds as mitigation problems, causes signs, symptoms, adverse effects. And also not management, manager, risk assessment, business model, distribution model, and so on. Yeah. So you can do this in slightly different ways. Um, but what you, when you press enter, what you're going to get is then a list of almost 4,000 two-word combinations that, describe, that are associated with influential patents, that are new, and describe a technological innovation in the sense that they associate primarily with a Wikipedia page that describes the technology. Now, the other problem that Wikipedia will help me solve is that among this list of 4,000, I'll show you that in a second, there are going to be several biograms that kind of describe the same thing, like cloud computing, cloud storage, cloud services. That's all about like cloud computing in the broadest sense. And I want a way of make, basically making a group of biograms that all kind of describe a similar technological innovation. So I'm going to group these biograms by the title of the primary Wikipedia page that they're associated with. So then these 4,000 biograms are then associated with 2,628 unique technologies. Yeah, so I'm going to call a technology a group of biogram. You can group them in different ways. This is just one way that is very natural given the way that we've identified technologies. Okay, so that's it. So now I have a list of new technologies that were invented since 1976. So now the next, next step is I want to learn something about these technologies by assigning them characteristics. So I'm going to cross-reference this list of biograms back to where they came from. I'm going to go, now go and look, can I find these biograms like smartphone as a biogram? And we'll look for the smartphone biogram in, in patents. Now, what's nice about the patents is they tell us they have a date, yeah, the, the, the year in which they were granted, and they have a location attached to them. So what I'm going to be able to do is I'm going to be able to tell you when was this technology born and where was it born. So let's define a year of emergence for a given technology as the year in the patent time series when, this, when the number of mentions first grows by, by at least 10% in five consecutive years. So I'm basically going, this is the time series for how often people mention smartphones, right? It kind of didn't exist for a long time. And then all of a sudden it grows exponentially and goes off the charts. And what I'm doing here is I'm basically having a rule that consistently picks one of these points for all technologies. It doesn't really matter whether you now say, you know, like it's 1995 or 1998. The point is I'm going to find a time before this big acceleration and I'm going to call that uh, the, the birth year. Yeah. Sorry, doesn't this bias our sort of consumer application? Uh, there is this technology, lit lithography, to do microchips that is super, super important, but probably is not cited massively because uh, it's not a smartphone that everybody we talk about. It's so something for a very narrow industry. Right. So this is citations in patents. So it has to be cited by other experts. And I consciously chose a rule here that is scale independent. So I'm basically saying you need to grow by a certain percentage for five years, but I'm not saying you have to have at least 100 or 1,000 patents. So we're kind of allowing here also for the fact that in some areas of technology, you're more likely to take out a patent than others you're not. Um, so, so we purposely had a scale-independent char uh, characteristic here. Um, another thing you can do is you can just like I say, your birth year is when, once you hit like 100 patents. It turns out, like for our regressions, it's not going to matter all that much. Um, but so definitely you can do this in a number of different ways. The second, the second step here is, is less, it's le so it's very clear, how, so there, there's less leeway here. So now, okay, remember we have now a couple of thousand new technologies, now I've assigned them a birth year. Now the th next thing I wanna assign is where did they come from? And that's kind of a little bit easier because now I can say, well the, the patent is gonna have the list of inventors and their addresses so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a pioneer location as the top area, so this is the commuting zone, that accounts for at least 50% of a technology's patents 10 years after its birth. So I'm going to look at the first 10 years in which this technology was around, and I'm going to look at where are the places where people were filing the patents that mentioned this technology. And then I'm going to go down the list. I'm going to start with the biggest place, the second biggest place, and the third biggest place until I hit 50%. So the self-driving car, by this measure, came from San Francisco, Detroit, and San Jose. 
The lane departure warning came from Grand Rapids, Wyoming. Uh, sorry, Grand Rapids, Michigan. So, you, uh, so obviously, like the car, it's a car industry development. Digital imaging came from Rochester and brackets Kodak, famously. Fort Collins, San Jose, and LA. And the smartphone, again, came from San Francisco, San, Ho San Jose, Seattle, and LA. So now I have the list of the technologies. I have a year in which they were born and a place where they came from. The third thing I don't have a slide for is I'm now going to do the same thing with earnings calls. I'm going to go and look how many times was this technology mentioned in earnings calls, and I'm roughly going to call that the degree of disruptiveness to business of this new technology. The more managers talk about it, presumably either the more opportunity or threat they see in that new technology. So here's now, okay, great. So now here's kind of like the first big output from this. This is like a little bit of a Python program. You press enter and then it's gonna spit out some stuff. Okay, so remember we have about 3,000 technologies. Uh, I'm gonna show you now the top technologies that managers talked about most that came, that had a birth year in the 2000s. Cloud computing. Social networking, smart grid, self-driving, facial recognition, augmented reality, solar panel, 3D printing, unstructured data, Windows Mobile, and it goes on. So that makes some sense, right? So take a mental snapshot of these, and now try to think back to the 90s. What were big innovations that came out of the 90s? The mobile phone, mobile devices, debit cards, smartphones, financial instrument, machine learning, data warehouse, drug discovery, combination therapy, digital content. Okay, that sounds about right. Now let's look at what came out of the 80s. User interface, flat panel display, cell site, digital video, digital camera, wireless network, model organism. This was actually, this, I thought this was wrong, but it actually turns out it's not because there was an advancement in genetics that would allow you to build custom model organisms with specific characteristics and then kind of essentially do experiments on them, unfortunately. Um, optical fiber, virtual reality, medical imaging. Okay, so we now have a list of important technologies and we can assign them to different years and we have a, a grouping of language that we assign to each of these technologies. So far so good? Okay, <clears throat> so that was the first step. So we took patents and we held it next to Wikipedia and we shook and we got a list of new technologies. So now the key step is gonna, is gonna be to go and see how are these new technologies affecting jobs? And this actually in fact like a gigantic literature in economics doing exactly that, but how are we doing it normally? We're usually doing it by staring at wage data and we're writing down a production function and we impose equilibrium in the labor market and then we say something about what's, what technology is doing. So when you see this, normally in economics, the effect of technology is kind of the residual, the thing that kind of we didn't see. Now we're going to try and make visible exactly what are the jobs that are using, producing, and developing a given new technology. So here's how I want to do that. So here's an example of a job posting. I have a list of my 4,000 biograms now that I'm looking for, and I'm looking for mentions of these biograms in job postings. So this is, you can't read this, but basically what you're supposed to see is that like this job posting is uh, a research scientist for, uh, about video understanding and it's speech recognition, natural language processing, that's what we're doing right now, <laughs> image processing, machine learning, AI, boom, 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 okay? so this is definitely a job posting that uh, um, is using, developing, or producing several of our new technologies. So an important question then, of course, is, it, is what does it mean if the technology is mentioned in the job posting? And you know, most of you are too young for this, but like, you know, if you've ever hired a nanny, you learn very quickly how to write a job posting effectively. You have to write what are your, like, what are you, how do you have to be able to do? What is the experience that you need to bring? And what does the job entail? So, coming back to our example here, I'm gonna have a lot of job postings, in fact, two thirds of them that are basically about, you have to be able to use this technology. So for example, 
you're going to be using third channel technology on a smart device to collect crucial data to engage with consumers. Okay, so this is a job where you get, they give you a smart device and you do something with it. Here's a systems engineer who is engaged with producing that technology. So you will play a key role in the development, testing, and validation of new chips in the growing smart TV market. If we have time, I'm going to do this more carefully later. I just want to kind of fix ideas that essentially if a new technology is mentioned in a job posting, it means that the job is either using, developing, or producing that technology. Okay. One thing that you might think about is like some job posting start was we are an AI company and we need somebody to clean the bathrooms. Um, so you, you, you can get rid of like 98% of that by just skipping the first two sentences in the job postings, uh, which, which is what we do here. Okay. So, all right. So now let's have a first look at the data that comes out here. So I'm going to look at what is the relationship between technologies that managers talk about, the number of earnings, call, men, earnings calls that mention the technology, over the number of jobs that also mention the technology. Now, there's a lot more jobs than earnings calls. So like this here is on a log logarithmic scale. So a million is over here, and 10,000 is there. OK? So what do we see? So we see that there's actually like, so, so I, I guess I want you to see two things. The first thing I want you to see is that what the technologies that managers talk about are the same technologies that are important for jobs. So I haven't fitted a line around here, but the R squared is 50% of a line, and the slope is 0.41. Okay, so this is a pretty strong association. I've put little labels to give you an idea of what these different technologies are. Yeah, so technologies that have very... A uh, few jobs associated with it are like things, linear transformation. I think I have logistic regression here. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah, so if you hang out here long enough, you'll know what that is. Um, lots and lots of job postings talk about mobile phones, cloud computing, and machine learning. Okay, so it's a, it's a completely different story. So this, okay, first thing, managers, if managers talk about the technology, it's becoming important for the labor market. Second thing, there's a really fat tail. Remember, this is a logarithmic scale. So there's very few technologies, actually just a couple of hundred, that drive most of the variation in job postings. So in fact, you know, if I just look at these, it's probably going to be enough to just figure out what's going on. So another way of seeing this is like, so I'm going to call technologies that are mentioned in at least 100 earnings calls, I'm going to call them disruptive. Okay. So these and now let's compare the disruptive to the non-disruptive technologies. Well, the disruptive technologies, on average, have about 100,000 jobs associated with them, whereas the non-disruptive technologies have basically none. Yeah, so <coughs> very few technologies are driving this variation. The disruptive technologies are responsible for, more than, for way more than half of all mentions of technologies in job postings. And in fact, it's 17.6% of, of all job postings mention one of these 314 technologies. Yeah, so, there, so if we understand the 314, we'll understand a lot about what the new technologies are doing to the labor market. OK. And now, as Gene Fama likes to say, we're going to let the data sing. So the first thing I want to look at is the geographic concentration in where these disruptive technologies that seem to be so important for jobs, where are they coming from? So we're going to look at this in two different ways. First, I want to show you where are the patents coming from that mention the disruptive technologies. So I have a million, a third of the patents in my sample mention one of our 314 disruptive technologies. 41% of them come from five commuting zones in the US. The US has like 1,000 commuting zones. Five commuting zones are producing 41% of the patents that mention these new technologies, and they are San Jose, San Francisco. You might say that's the same, one, same thing. New York, Boston, and Seattle. Now, there's a lot of literature in economics about how, how patenting and, in general, research is very highly spatially concentrated. This is worse than all the other things you've seen before. Worse. I don't know if it's worse, but it's more concentrated. So if you look at like overall patenting, the top five CBSAs that 
are just lead with, le so Chicago's in that list, that lead in terms of patents, account for 32% of all patents. If you look at other things that we know are skewed, like the distribution of college graduates across the US, 22% is accounted for by the top five. So you see this is suspiciously concentrated. This is a characteristic not of all patents that mention new technologies, but specifically of the ones that affect the labor market the most. So if you compare the concentration of where the, the, the patents mentioning disruptive technologies come from, that's much higher than the concentration for non-disruptive patents, meaning patents that mention some of our technologies that we have classified as not, not causing too much stress to managers. Okay, so enough of that. So now another way of looking at kind of the same thing is looking at where did early patenting in these technologies come from. So the numbers I gave you were for all patents. Now I'm just going to look at the patents that are filed 10 years after the birth of the technology. So where was the crucial development happening? So these are the pioneer locations that I defined earlier. And I'm just showing you on a map where they are. The blue circles give you an idea of how many pioneer locations. So each technology can have one, or sometimes up to five or six pioneer locations. And the circles kind of tell you where they are. And what you see, California is doing a lot. And the Northeast Corridor is doing a lot. Silicon Valley alone, that's San Francisco and San Jose, accounts for 25% of the pioneer locations. The Northeast Corridor, these are pioneer locations of disruptive technologies. The Northeast Corridor, taken together, does about the same. Another 25%. Now we're up to 50%. The rest of the country can divide the remaining 50%. So these pioneer locations are spatially very, very highly concentrated. There's lots of puzzles in economics about, you know, why are house prices so high in Boston? Okay, well, it's a, it's a puzzle, to, like, okay. Maybe this has something to do with it. Yeah, so. Okay. Now, if you want to look, I think this is more informative. Like, you really need to understand like two sets of places. You can also say, okay, now let's run the regression, and the regression will tell you, well, the places with a lot of pioneer locations have a lot of university grads, have a lot of rich universities, and have a lot of educated people who also have PhDs. All right. So that was the first fact about geographic concentration. Now let me talk a little bit about spreading out. And I think that sort of in the, so when I was in grad school, when we were kind of talking about economic growth, we were looking at models that had no locations in, locations in them. So the classic view of economic growth is somebody invents something, and then the invention is non-rival. You probably have learned about this in your macro course. Everybody can use it the blueprints become available everywhere. What you're going to see here is that that's not the case at all. So um, this is my, the same picture that we had before. And now I'm superimposing on that picture. Where is early employment in that same technology? So remember, like this is kind of showing you, I'm going to show you regressions later that partial it out within technology. But just visually, I'm going to put now red dots that are proportional to the size of the jobs five years after the birth of the technology that mention the new technology. And what you see, the red dots are in the blue circles, meaning early employment in a new technology is highly, highly concentrated in the same place where the technology was invented. So it seems kind of important where it was invented because that's where now people are going to have jobs that relate to that technology. Now, you can like sort of, we tried to make a film, but we're not technolo technologically savvy for, enough for that. So if you then look at the next one, six to 10 years out from the birth of the technology, you see like the grid is sort of like getting more fuzzy and spreading sort of in the area. And 
11 to 15 years, 16 to 20 years, and 21 to 30 years. And you see there, there is like a lot a geographic spread with a st strong geographic, what I would call a, a strong geographic gradient. We'll see that in the regressions where like the adjacent places seem to be getting the new technology first. Okay, any questions so far? All right. So now I want to do this in a much, in a, like the picture is sort of giving you an idea, but like now I want to like do this in a much more systematic manner. So, uh, and this is like the only math we're going to do today. So what I want to measure is the normalized share of employment and technology tau in location CBSA at time t. So why normalized share? Well, because I want to, in my regression, I don't want to worry about the fact that like, you know, LA has more of all jobs, right, because then Oshkosh, Wisconsin. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the share of jobs in technology tau in location CBSA at that time and divide it by the share of all jobs that are in that location at that point in time. So I'm normalizing out how big the place is in terms of population, basically. And then I'm going to define something that is called the coefficient of variation, which is just a measure of dispersion or concentration, if you like. So I'm going to take the standard deviation of this thing or divided by its mean. So in other words, I'm collapsing all I have this like very rich data set at the you know, location, technology, time level, but I'm just collapsing everything into a data set that's only now describing each technology at each point in time. And for that, I'm basically concentrating, I'm, I'm basically calculating how concentrated is that technology geographically at that point in time. So here's just a picture that shows you almost everything that you need to, you need to know. So the, the, the bubbles here are bin scatter plots of the data. And uh, what I'm plotting here is the degree of concentration of the jobs in that technology. So how concentrated are they spatially in individual places? And plotting it over how old the technology is. And what you see is that the older the technology gets, the less concentrated is it in space. But now these numbers also mean something. So if you measure the concentration of college graduates across locations, that's about a three. So college graduates are quite concentrated, but that's sort of like a good like ben benchmark maybe. So after 30 years, a technology ha gets to that level. So that means if you let a technology spread for 30 years, it's going to be about as concentrated as uh, the, uh, the normalized share of the population that has a college degree. The intercept here is something like six. Yeah, so um, I guess I don't have a good example for that. So, but much, much more co concentrated. Uh, and maybe the, the pictures were kind of more informative for that. Okay, so now we're going to do this like, now there's sort of a, there's sort of like complicated questions about, you know, uh, is that, is this picture here like across technology, is this driven by variation across technologies or within technology and so forth? So we can go and look at that. So I'm putting the coefficient of variation of each technology tau at each time t on the left hand side. And on the right hand side of my regression, I'm just put the age of the technology. And you get like this negative slope that I just showed you in the picture. And this is exactly the same slope you just saw. Uh, now you can throw in some technology fixed effects. So now that looks at like, you know, only within each technology, like forgetting the differences between technologies on average, within a given technology, it does that spread across space. And the answer is yes, and with a similar coefficient. And uh, there's sort of some evidence of sort of like some sloping, maybe it's converging to something, right? So this is a quadratic term here. The quadratic term is positive, which kind of suggests that initially the spread is faster and then maybe it gets slower over time. Uh, there's sort of like a famous paper by Grillikies about this. It's called the S-curve uh, in the spread of technology. Okay. So now we wanted to know a little bit more about this spread. So this seems pretty key about how technology is spread across space. Uh, here is a way of getting at that. So remember, I know actually quite a lot about the job postings that are driving this kind of data. So I can go back to the beginning of my data construction, and for each job posting, I know which occupation it's in. 
So like dentist or professor or you know, something else. So for occupations, we know uh, we, we have classifications into high skill versus low skill, requires college degree or not, for example. So I can work backwards and say, okay, for each job posting, I know on average, does it require a college degree or not? And now I'm gonna do my, this entire exercise separately for jobs that require a college degree and jobs that don't. And remember, if you slide down in this graph, it means you're spreading fast. So the blue is the low skill and the red is the high skill. And what you see is that the low skill jobs that are associated with the new technologies are spreading much, much faster than the high skill jobs. So the high skill jobs seems to be sticking around where they were before, but the low skill jobs are the ones that are spreading. Another way of getting at this is by looking at the language of the job posting itself. So what I'm gonna do next is I wanna make a different distinction, not into high and low skill, but into use versus produce or develop. So I wanna separate the jobs that say something about, we want you to come and develop or produce this technology and separate it from, from postings that say, we want you to come and use this technology. And that seems like a pretty crucial distinction. The way that you can do this is you can take out the, the sentence in the job posting that mentions the technology and do some further analysis on it. I'm not gonna go into like the details of that, but there's basically some very, very simple natural language processing you can do to come up with a list of words that you're likely to find in sentences that say, we want you to come and use AI as opposed to, we want you to come and develop AI. So for example, develop versus use is a pretty clear sign of what we want you to do with the technology. So there's kind of a lot of details about how to do this and how to tell whether you're doing a good job, but now let's, let's just look at the picture that we get out of it, and it looks very similar to the one that, that we had before. So the blue are the jobs that use the technology, and the red are the jobs that produce, develop, uh, or research the technology. And although this is a bit noisier than before, it seems pretty clear that the research, develop, and production of the new technology seems to be spreading much slower than the use of, than, uh, than the, use of the technology. Yeah? So this is consistent with what we had before. If you think that the jobs that are involved with using the technology are gonna be lower skill than the jobs that are involved with producing or developing the technology. So in other words, why do we think the technologies are spreading at a certain speed? Well, if they're at the stage where they can be used by low-skilled people, it's gonna be spreading much faster. Okay, so I wanna run one more regression that is kind of instructive. It's kind of looking at the same thing, but from a slightly different angle. One thing that my kind of uh, graphs weren't showing you before is whether the spread is also between sort of like, is, you know, it could be that there's some spread between, you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts and San Jose, or what, you know, it's like the technology kind of jumping and is it really like an advantage of specifically the place or is it common to all highly educated places, for example? Luigi, you have a question? Uh, yeah, but maybe even for later. I know that uh, you have limited time uh, span, but I was wondering whether in the 80s the spread was uh, more slow than uh, in the 2010. It says, you imagine that uh, with the current technologies, easier to spread than the past. If that's a great question. The big problem is that in the 80s, people weren't writing online job postings. So the, in some sense, the weakest part of our data is the one about job postings because that's only 10 years. The reason I can say something about 30 years here is because I'm basically comparing the spread of technologies that were, how, how diffused are the, the uh, technologies that were developed in the 80s and I'm comparing the ones that are, to the ones that are being developed today. That's the so, and this kind of has all kinds of issues about like we can't distinguish cohort and time effects here. So there's both a conceptual and a data limitation to like answering exactly that question. And you can now use some census classification of the types of jobs? So people have tried. The other big data source for this are ONET job description, or ONET um, occupation descriptions, but they're famously slow moving and very little pieces of text and it's like a big, there's a paper by Kogan et al that tries to do this and it's like a big exercise. 
Um, so essentially, like one thing, this is about natural language processing, is like you always want to look for corpuses of text that are big, because then like noise washes out. If you have pieces of text, so sorry, you want okay, so you want a lot of text from as many entities as possible. If you want to do natural language processing on like a five-page list descriptions of major occupations that are all like just a few lines long, you have to do very much more complicated things. So and that's the problem in that literature. Um, so you then need to take this sentence and project it on an embedding vector and try and figure out is this kind of is this way of saying AI kind of similar to other ways of saying AI and like all kinds of problems. You don't have any of these problems if you have a lot of text, which is why I like corpuses with just a lot of text. So I digress. So, <clears throat> all right, but the way, to, okay, yeah. So there's some limitations here. Um, so I was, okay, so for this table, I was thinking of like, you know, a French mayor who wants to have the next Silicon Valley in their town. Okay, so this is actually a very popular thing among kind of local politicians is we want to be an innovation hub for stuff. And at some level, you know, our paper is saying it, it's, if you become a pioneer location for something that later is commercially successful, that, you know, let's, let's see how good that is for you if you manage to do that. So I'm having a, so now I'm, I, so, so now I'm, I'm going to reshape my data set. I'm going to have an, an observation of my data set is now going to be a location, a place in the U.S., technology time. So I'm going to have the, the, the number of it, the share of jobs in that location at that point in time that are in a given technology. And I'm running a regression of that on a dummy that's one if that location is the pioneer location for that technology. So in other words, you can interpret this coefficient as saying that on average in our sample, if you are the pioneer location, if you have developed a given technology, you have 60% more jobs in that technology done than everywhere else on average. In the second column, I'm adding an inter interaction for the age of the technology. So this now says, at birth, in year zero of the technology, the pioneer location has 207.2% more jobs in that technology than other places. And that advantage erodes over time at a rate of 5.6, 5.9 percentage points per year. Then you can look at around the pioneer location, you find a similar thing. So the places that are close to Silicon Valley also have more of that technology. And that also seems to erode, although it's not statistically significant. So now I want to do the same thing and split this up between the different types of jobs to see how long is the pioneer advantage lasting. So we can estimate, this is what I just showed you for all technology jobs, these two numbers you've just seen. But now let me do it separately for high skill jobs and low skill jobs. So you see that you know, both for high skill jobs and low skill jobs, at the year of birth of the technology, the pioneer location has a big advantage. But then the low skill, the, the advantage for the low skill jobs erodes at almost twice the rate. And so basically you can use this to estimate, okay, it's going to take on average 27.8 years for the advantage of the pioneer location in low skill jobs to erode. But it takes 41.7 years on average for the high skill advantage to erode. So the high skill jobs move out, but they move out at a much, much lower rate. And the same is true for this distinction between production and use. The, the research, uh, development, and production jobs are spreading out much, much slower than the use jobs, although this distinction here we're not doing quite as well, so there's a bit of attenuation. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you is evidence of skill broadening. And I should give you like a little bit of context here. So there is a gigantic literature in economics about skill bias technical progress, which you may have had some contact with. So Labor economists worry a lot about this idea that technical progress favors the highly educated and creates predominantly jobs that require a lot of education. If that's the case, educated people, the skill premium, that's why you're here, presumably, the skill premium gets higher and higher and higher, and people who don't go to college are going to have a lower and lower, lower wage relative compared to the rest of the population. Yeah, that's a major concern. 
almost all, almost everything that we know about this comes from data sets where we just look at wages of different professions and compare them. And then assume there's equilibrium in the labor market and this estimate a production function and it's kind of complicated. I'm not gonna show you maybe the most straightforward and most easily interpretable evidence of skill bias technical progress that I think has been produced so far. Let me be more precise. What I'm plotting here is for each technology at each point in time, the share of job postings in that technology that require a college degree. So now we're back to having a data set that's for each technology, each point in time, or how old it is. So for each technology age combination, what is the share of job postings that require you to have gone to college in order to apply for this job that mentions a new technology? So there's two important things about this graph. One is it's downward sloping, thank God. Secondly, it has an intercept of 63.3. What this means is that at birth, 63.3% on average of jobs that mention the technology require a college degree. On average, 27.3% of the US population have a college degree. So that's in the floor. Okay, you can't see it here on my graph. So what that means is that jobs that are about using, producing, or developing a new technology are massively skill biased. Nowhere near the average of the population. The second thing that you should see is that here there's a negative slope. So over 30 years we get down to something like 50. So that means it takes 30 years to get, go about a third of the way. Now the fact that this thing is downward sloping was actually like a big bone of contention in the literature. There's sort of a literature by my famous uh, colleague, uh, Pasquale Restrepo and his co-author, Duran Asimoglu, uh, have a series of papers about why will robots not replace us? And in these models, it's absolutely crucial that as technologies mature, people with low skills at some point can start using them. And that's exactly what this negative slope here is telling you, and it's telling you something about the speed at which that's happening. So, uh, so I guess that means it takes something like 65 years for a technology from its inception to like it gets to the level of the average education of the US population in terms of the jobs that are, it's associated with. Okay, and I, I think that's long, but I need to ask Pasquale about exactly what they were expecting. All right, so now you can show the same thing in regressions. Maybe that's not so interesting here. Like what, what I, I guess like I'm, I'm, I'm taking the, 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 the skill requirement of technology tau at time t and I'm regressing it on, on the age of the technology. And again, you see these negative slopes that I just showed you. That's true both within and across technologies. Um, it doesn't look like this kind of process is getting slower over time, right? So it's like, there doesn't seem to be much of a curvature. Um, another interesting way of looking at the same data is like, I'm gonna repeat this ex exact analysis, but instead of looking at the skill requirement of the job postings, we're gonna look at the wage associated with the job posting. So what this here means is that I'm holding constant and constant 2015 dollars. So I'm, I'm taking out any effect of inflation on average, jobs that, uh, the, on average, jobs that uh, use, produce, or develop the technology um, are declining in wage by $578 per year. So that means, you know, you start out by paying a lot of money, and then over time it's lower and lower wage jobs that seem to be using this technology. Yes, it's another way of looking at the same thing. So like I know a negative coefficient in front of wage always looks bad, but this is actually a good thing. Okay. You're not interested in this. Uh, let me show you one more thing that you can do with this data uh, that is kind of fun. Um, we've put this data up online because it's way, way more than we can handle uh, to an analyze. But uh, so there's kind of two uh, two big things that are fairly obvious and that kind of need to be done. 
there's a big literature about trying to understand what are the determinants of making a Silicon Valley, essentially. Now, a big problem that, in that literature has been is that there wasn't a systematic way of keeping track of where is the pioneer location of which technology and how successful is that technology later. So we have a way of doing that now. So we have a way of studying pioneer locations that we didn't have before. And in fact, a part of the data that I haven't used yet is that the job posting also says the name of the firm at which you're supposed to work. So you can go and look at sort of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the dynamics of these pioneer locations and maybe try and find out why are so many pioneer locations for so many technologies all in the same place, like Silicon Valley or Chicago or Boston. So here's one example of why that might be happening. So I'm looking at the geographic, this is kind of a confusing graph, but like what this, what this, uh, what this graph is showing is the geographic footprint of both General, General Motors and Ford Motor Company before and after the birth of the self-driving technology, which just happens during our sample. So what I'm showing you here is that, so the green is the number of jobs that General Motors advertises in its headquarters in other locations that are not its headquarters and in the places that invented the self-driving technology. And you see the green here is much bigger than the red. So that means, so essentially what this here means is that after self-driving cars were invented, General Motors massively expands its activities in Silicon Valley. And then moreover, we can look at the job postings that, that GM posts in Silicon Valley and lo and behold, they mention self-driving cars, okay? So what this here means is that there's an established firm that used to hang around in Michigan. Now self-driving technology gets invented in California instead of, and now GM has a facility in Silicon Valley to try and pick up some of that new technology. And you see the same thing for Ford. Yeah, so they basically had one person in Silicon Valley before, and now, that's, now they have 100. And these, when these 100 people get hired, it says something about self-driving cars. So I think there's kind of fun papers to be written about this. We didn't have time to do it. Uh, but also, I'm out of time uh, here, so I want to conclude. So look, staring at text and overlapping the information that we have in different corpuses of text can give you a flexible methodology to identify new impactful technologies and to trace them to their origins uh, uh, and then look at their spread across job postings. New technologies in the beginning when they're born are geographically very highly concentrated. Over time, they spread geographically, but you know, they don't spread really at the speeds that, you know, decades, not four years. Like, you know, I always compare it to like, you know, the election cycle. Yeah, so it's the, much slower than the election cycle. As the, the technologies mature, it goes through a skill broadening, mean, meaning lower and lower skilled people can use the technology. And once that happens, the spread gets faster. What this means, taking these facts together, is that the places where new technologies are invented have a massive advantage in high skill employment in that technology for a long time to come. So that's it. Thank you. So I want to, I know there's probably questions. I wanted to advertise that I am looking for an MBA summer intern to help with a startup. So I'm just going to put this up while we talk. So we have a startup that helps uh, central banks use some of the uh, central banks and other research institutions helps, helps them use some of these techniques that I've introduced this week. And if this is of interest, please email me as we're holding interviews next week. We, need, we desperately need help with business because we're not good at that, surprisingly. All right, are there any questions? Um, I was just wondering your thoughts on the idea of buzzwords. So yeah. there are just a lot of job postings or earnings calls. Like these people mentioned some words that not that are ne not necessarily their focuses or you know not actually what the job involves. So does your model like factor that in? Do you remember when we had the 35,000 biograms and then I said we have to go look at Wikipedia to see if it's a technological innovation or something else? And I said the other categories are new problems or uh, management technologies. A lot of the latter are buzzwords where it's like, you know, 
different types of man like I concepts that were around like asset management like we didn't we didn't say asset management in the 70s we said something else but clearly there was asset management so that that wikipedia step is main, is meant to filter out these these words that are just spreading because they're buzzy. Yeah. This is a very simple question about biograms. <clears throat> question about um, biograms at, at the very simple beginning level. Does every single two word combination that appears start, go into your starting data set? You know, we are. Yes. So you know, we are a company, are, so, we are. So that's a great question. So I know that like if you've taken a course on computational linguistics, your, your ears must be ringing from like we need to pre-process the data and get rid of stop words and so forth. It really depends on the application. So all the applications that I typically use try to keep the, I am actually have a, I just have a difference of opinion on this. Like I like to keep the, the text intact as much as possible because I want to be, always be able to go back to the text and look at what's actually happening. If you do more complicated things like multinomial inverse regression, you can, you, know, you can only use that on like 30,000 biograms to begin with, right? So then you need to pre-process the text and basically kill most of the biograms. So we don't need to do that here. So uh, I, I always say you do the pre-processing if you need to, if you have a problem like inverting your regression matrix at some point. We never get to this point here, so that's why we're not butchering the text. But it's a matter of taste. There's no clear... People have a lot of opinions about this that I think are like coming from very specific applications. This is a different application. Like it doesn't seem to be like such an issue here. Um, I had a question about government intervention. Um, is there like a, can you define a regional uh, premium where uh, government intervention, if they don't hit that amount, they don't invest that amount in transferring technologies or, or opening, uh, you know, centers of excellence in under invested areas? where it's pointless or is it pointless no matter what? I think the policy implications here are complicated because essentially like when studying this stuff in economics, we usually assume that knowledge once it's created can just travel wherever it wants. The fact that you guys are here and you need to spend like two years to pick up the knowledge kind of I guess already shows that it's not so easy. Um, it's unclear to me whether, I mean our main goal here was first like let's make visible the disparities in spread. And then we can go and study, like we put all this data up on our website, we can go and study the disparities of spread and see things like, you know, is it like, you seem to think, or, or you seem to have, have in mind that maybe um, having uh, another university, even if it's not kind of doing research on the technology, might help, you know, transfer the technology. It's a complicated process, right, because that's about labor supply and labor demand. It's about firm decisions and decisions by people to get certain trainings and so forth. One thing that we've tried is to see whether uh, mentions of uh, qualifications. So, so we've kind of looked at, like, how many job postings say you need to know how to use Microsoft Office or, like, you need to, you need to know how to use some new technology. Um, we haven't really found that that makes the that, that makes the spread so much faster, but I don't. I'm not sure what it means. I guess like my point is that there are going to be policy implications because we know that in some sense we want these technologies to spread as fast as possible, right? So that's I think it's going to be hard to find an economic model where that's not the case. And then the question is, how do you encourage the spread? And it's we don't know, but I th I hope we've produced the data to maybe somebody sometime thinking figuring it out. Thank you. Uh, that last bit you showed where the example of GM, um, you know, hiring some more jobs in the place where the innovation was happening. Uh, did your data also happen to have if the firms were moving headquarters themselves to those places? Are yeah, they, that's a great question, right? So I, uh, I, I don't have the data here, but um, so we haven't collected that data. But certainly there's been sort of a rut. Like, so if, you, if, you, if you've been following sort of, you know, like, uh, I'm thinking about CAT moving out of uh, Peoria. Peoria and Even there's lots of play, like a GE moving to Boston and all this stuff. So they say they're doing this because they want to find talent, right? That sounds like it's about labor supply. Maybe it's connected with this. Uh, certainly, 
yeah, if you think that self-driving technology is super important and you need to hire lots of people, maybe that's so. I mean, this is like a small. This, now they're not. They're definitely not moving the headquarters, right? But yeah. they are moving. They are changing their footprint. Tarek, I have a question concerning leading indicators. Uh, once uh, breakout technology comes big in earnings calls or in the job postings, this is when it's already, when it has arrived. Yeah. Did you find anything in your data that is indicating what the next big things So are? across my research agenda, I have done nothing with forecasting. The, uh, there are important questions. I think the most immediate thing that somebody, like maybe me, but somebody, it's not really my thing, but like uh, what we talked about on Tuesday, like it's very clear to me that earnings calls are going to be, it's very clear that earnings calls are going to be really good at forecasting stuff. Why? Because essentially a company announces its earnings, that's accounting data about what happened last quarter, right? And then they go on the phone and they produce 15 pages of text about what they think is going to happen next quarter. So what do you think is going to be the more useful resource for predicting what happens next quarter? So I think like, like the right person, I just don't know how economic forecasting works. So that's why we haven't done anything. Uh, but I, I am sort of interested in learning how that works. And I know that the, so, so for the startup that we're, uh, am I allowed to say this? Yeah. So there's a big international organization that is involved with making economic forecasts that is using the tools that we developed in the startup for forecasting. I just don't know how well it's going, but they are trying. I was wondering if the um, hiring in new technologies relative to hiring in all other hiring is pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical, or is any variation with the business cycle? Uh, I think our data set is not great for that. Because in some sense, I didn't tell you about this, but like, you know, like in 2010, when they start collecting the data, you know, the, bi the, the sample is a little biased. It's they don't have all the job postings yet because not all of them are online. And the ones that are online tend to be more about like tech. So this data set is not great for that. I'm sure there's other data sources that probably, so, so there's a big question about like, do technology spread faster in a boom or in a recession? And it could go either way. I think that's a great question. I don't think we have exactly the data to answer it here. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks for coming.